is Susan Murphy, who is an eminent statistician at Harvard. Uh, she has all kinds of awards and prizes. So she was a 2013 MacArthur Fellow for her work on using experimental design to inform sequential decision making. Uh, we're thrilled to have her as a part of our IDSS Distinguished Lecture Series. So please join me in welcoming her. OK. It's on, yeah. Um, it's great to be here with you. Um, so this is a, do I really need this thing? Oh, OK. Um, yeah, it's very loud. OK, I guess I will. How's that? OK, that's good. Um, so this is uh, this, the work I'm going to talk to you about today. It's motivated by two studies, uh, both of which were Oralytics is going to go into the field. Um, I don't know, it was supposed to be January, but now it's looking like February, maybe, Kelly, or March. I can't remember. And it gets delayed. And then my wave is an, one for adolescents that are smoking too much pot. That's going to go into the, in the summer. And um, this is a setting where we, I'll, I'll try and explain, make it clear as we go through, but um, we really wanted to run a particular type of RL algorithm, and everything was waiting on Kelly to do the math so that we could actually run it. So it's one of the few times in my entire life that a very applied setting was just absolutely, it was critically impacted by the ability to do the math so that we could move on. So uh, I want to thank my collaborators. There's Kelly here, and she's in the audience. Anna Trella, who's also a CS student uh, in Harvard, just like Kelly. Uh, Billy is a behavioral scientist. Vivek Shetty is a dental surgeon. Uh, I'll mostly talk about the oralytics. And Lucas Janssen is in uh, statistics. And then there's a large uh, software engineering team that's involved in this study as well. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about oralytics to, to set the problem up. Uh, and then we'll go on to the, the more theoretical challenge that was ra raised by oralytics. OK, so um, here the goal is um, this is uh, a study that's going to go on in Southern California. Um, it's for individuals who are at high risk of dental disease. Uh, and it involves uh, a Bluetooth-enabled toothbrush and an app on the phone, all of which this entire team is developing. And the, the goal is to help these people learn how to properly brush their teeth. Um, it's a 10-week trial. Not a lot of time, 70 days, uh, and it'll involve around 75 people. We're supposed to, our job, our team's job, is to develop the RL algorithm and to ensure that data analyses can be done after the study. I'll get into that, because that's the critical issue here. And so when I say micro-randomization, this is just cueing you that any kind of algorithm we develop is probabilistic in the sense that it'll choose actions in a probabilistic way. Um, so oralytics only has uh, two decision times per day, 70 days, only 140 times per individual. Right away, you should be concerned about the use of a RL algorithm, because we know that they learn relatively slowly. The state is a variety of data from the app, uh, from the, the toothbrush. Uh, and I just listed some of the state information. And the action here, and this is pretty common with these apps, is um, there's actually, uh, each of these two times, there's four types of actions that one can uh, select, the algorithm can select. But the ones that we're going we're gonna to focus on, the algorithm will focus on send a suggestion versus not. And this has to do with the signal versus noise ratio. Uh, we're likely to get the highest signal for the algorithm to learn between sending a suggestion versus not. You'll see on the next slide examples of the types of the kinds of suggestions. Uh, so we're going to focus on deliver versus not deliver. And the reward for the algorithm is a measure of the efficiency of the person in brushing their teeth subsequent to the action, delivery of the action, uh, uh, 
possible delivery of the action. Here's an example. All of the suggestions have to do with um, either uh, you get a present and now you're going to reciprocate by staying engaged with trying to uh, learn how to brush your teeth well, or your favorite charity gets a present. It's these, or it has to do with some of the actions have to do with curiosity, learning more about yourself. So they're coming from that domain. Uh, so uh, the study moves forward. Uh, here you see the two times per day, and you see the four different types of actions. Uh, one that the first, uh, where the person could get a, uh, they get a present, and we hope they reciprocate. Uh, the other is their charity gets a present, and then the third is the curiosity one, or we don't bother them at all. Again, the RL algorithm is going to only focus between sending a suggestion versus not. Okay, so um, in these types of studies, when you're talking about sequential decision making in a, in a medical field, there's really tension. There's a tension that operates. And it's between personalization, that is learning within the study to help the person do better, and learning between studies. Because there's always in your mind, there's a sequence of studies in which you intend to develop these apps or refresh the apps or update the apps. Uh, so you have this tension that operates all the time between these two very competing objectives. So uh, of course, uh, within a study, one way to think about personalization is to use some sort of sequential decision-making algorithm, like an RL algorithm. Uh, after the study, though, you might be interested in a variety of causal inference type questions. For example, you might, be, you might wonder if the messages have a differential impact on measures of user engagement. User engagement is not the reward here for the algorithm. This is a different outcome. You, you might be interested in that. Uh, you might be interested in whether or not this differential impact by the messages changes by the user state. If they're more or less engaged at the present time and they get a suggestion, will they become more engaged and vice versa? So the challenge within a study is that um, the rewards are noisy. We only have 140 decision times per user. Slow learning, it's a disaster. So what do we do? What do we want to do? And we've been wanting to do this now across a variety of studies. We want to pull the data online. We've been wanting to do this for some time. And we were never able to. And there's, there's a reason. It's because the work that I'm going to talk about today hadn't happened. Okay. And we'll see why I say that. So we're going to, the algorithm is going to pull data across users. And, it's, and I just want to uh, do, uh, make sure everybody's on the same page. When you have a setting like this and you're talking about a, uh, an algorithm, you're really trading bias and variance. So the algorithms make a number of simplifying assumptions about the environment, and they operate within a more simplistic environment. So they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily have the most uh, correct or accurate model of the user. Again, we want to we're going to use we want to use an algorithm that pulls data across users. But at the end of the day, between studies, we want to be able to uh, uh, assess causal effects. There's going to be a variety of analyses that people want to do. These settings, um, there is uh, actually some work uh, in which people have pre-specified a primary analysis and then use that to pre-design the RL algorithm. This is not that setting here. There's a whole variety of analyses we may not even know about them at this time, and we have to make sure that we'll be able to run these analyses in order to do the between study learning. So this is um, all about, this really, all of these analyses are about updating the algorithm so that it works better in the next study. OK, so I'm going to talk to you about the challenge and the reason why we hadn't ran an algorithm that pulled data online in real time before. 
Okay, so here you have your users. I have three here. Uh, in this study, for example, um, people don't meet each other. They have no contact one with another. And it is from a certain, there's a certain catchment area in which these users are being recruited. So there, you can view them as coming from a population. So these users at the very beginning are independent. Their data should have no con connection one with the other. Right? And for the first round, the actions send us a message versus not, say, the morning of the first day, that's just randomized with some fixed probability on the very first day. So after you, you see these tuples, one per user, they're independent. You can think of them as, I, uh, as even IID, although independence is the critical characteristic. Then you take, the, you take all the data from all of your users, and you learn something about some sort of reward function or something of that. And this has parameters. I'll call these parameters betas here. And those parameters then go into the policy that is now used to choose the action at the second time point. So you learn, this, you learn these parameters. You form a policy. The algorithm learns the parameters. It forms the policy. Now it, it take, here we have pi hat 2. It inputs the state for the first person at time 2. It outputs a probability and uses that probability to choose the action at time 2. It inputs the state for the second person at time 2. It gets a probability and uses that probability to choose the action, and so on and so forth. So now all of a sudden there's dependence, right? Because depending on how one person responded here, that may influence what action is delivered at the next time. You proceed on, now you take all the data you've uh, uh, observed up to, up to uh, t through time two, you relearn your, your, the weights in your policy, now you, use your, you develop your policy and you use it again, time three, and so on and so forth. So what's happened here? What's we, what have we done by using a learning algorithm that pulls data? This algorithm is, the input is independent individuals, and the output is dependent individuals. That's essentially what we've done. So you have to think about how are you going, how will you do between study learning in this type of setting? Because now all your individuals are dependent one with another but in a very uh, special way. So uh, one, way, one thing that's well known in, in, in all of statistics is that when you, have, um, between, when you have dependence between trajectories, you get inaccurate measures of uncertainty. You don't have, like if there's uh, 300 people in your study, you don't have 300 independent units of information there, you have somehow a smaller sample size than you really think because of these dependence between the individuals. So you, get, you're, you think you're more certain than you actually are. That's the consequence. Uh, so, okay, so now we're in this setting. You know, we want to we wanna do this. We want to run an algorithm that pulls data across users. This, so if we do this, it'll be really nice because we'll learn a lot faster. People will experience, they'll get a better actions. We'll learn how to select, the algorithm will learn how to select the actions more effectively. Um, but after the study's over, we, we, we want to be able to analyze the data. There's an entire group of individuals that'll want to analyze the data. And how do people normally analyze the data in a clinical trial? They view it, they call it longitudinal data. So on each individual, you, th you can think of a trajectory and the trajectory here is observation, action, and outcome. And the state for the, re for the RL algorithm is some subset of the observations. The reward for the RL algorithm is some subset of the outcomes. Uh, and you have, so you have this, and you have it up to time t. In oralytics, capital T is only 140. One per person. Uh, N is 75, for example, in oralytics. Okay, so you think of this classically as longitudinal data. So I just wrote the same thing above. So what, is it, what does it mean when people talk about longitudinal data? What they mean is they want to allow very arbitrary different dependence within a user across time. 
So for example, their outcomes later in the study could arbitrarily or potentially arbitrarily depend on all of the actions they've received up to that time. Uh, you could have, it, it doesn't specify longitudinal data, may not specify a, 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 a t particular type of, of ARMA model or time series model. In general, you, you allow arbitrary dependence. So that's the nice thing about longitudinal data analyses is they allow this within user arbitrary dependence. But the big assumption they make is that the user's data is independent one between the others. That's, that's the constraint that these types of methods impose. And generally in a clinical trial, this is perfectly fine. People never meet each other. That You can assume that their data is independent. It's just that's not the case for us. If we want to pull, if the RL algorithm wants to pull data in order to personalize more quickly, that's not going to be the case anymore. Adaptively sampled data violates this independence. It violates multiple things, actually. So here's, this is the two things, it, two big things it violates. Class, most RL algorithms, they can result in sampling probabilities. That is, this is the policy, pro, this is the probability, that, the policy, that may not concentrate. I'll talk about that shortly. And they re produce trajectories that are not independent. So two, two issues, violating independence and violating concentration. And the concentration assumptions are used by traditional classical statistical methods. So what do I mean by concentration? I mean that this pi hat t, as the number of users increases, should settle down. It should go somewhere. And um, it's very easy to show that if there's very little signal at a particular time, then in certain settings, you, the pi hat t almost acts like a p-value. So it never goes to a certain value. Rather, it just, uni it just varies uniformly between 0 and 1. This is a disaster. And here's a, a graph that Kelly made in that type of a setting. Uh, so uh, you get, actually, you get non-normal distribution uh, uh, when you're, you're Sampling probabilities don't concentrate. You can get non-normal distribution. So here, this is just a comparison of two means, the treated mean minus the control mean. I mean, you know, normally the difference between two means, you, if uh, the sample size is anywhere past 10 or 15, that difference looks, has a normal sampling distribution. And this is clearly non-normal. OK. So what are we going to do? First of all, we're going to recognize that there's this tension between within study personalization and between study learning. So the very minute you have that tension, you're no longer looking to minimize classical regret. You, that just doesn't make sense anymore because you have to balance within study personalization, i.e. regret minimization, with between study learning. So what we're going to do instead is instead of using hard maxes and allowing, uh, we're going to use soft max, soft maxes, and you'll see an example uh, in a future slide. And what this does, well, first of all, the thing to realize is the algorithm is no longer regret minimizing. Just make sure we're all on the same page. It's not going to be regret minimizing. But the glorious thing about this is all of a sudden you can approximate like the difference between two sample means by a Gaussian distribution. So in a sense, it appears as if you're back into classical statistics because a, a, the, a Gaussian distribution is the kind of distribution that one uses to approximate the properties of many quantities that we estimate. Um, however, the variance in this Gaussian distribution will be off. And it's because your users are still dependent. Between, you still have dependence between individuals. Even though you have 400 people, you don't have 400 independent units of information. So you have to be careful about deriving some measure of uncertainty if you want to, say, compare two means 
or any kind of classical statistical analysis that requires a confidence interval. You have to be thoughtful about how are you going to derive the confidence interval, because you don't really have as much data as you think you do. Let's say this again. Um, so by concentration, we're going to use, an, I'm just repeating myself uh, right now. So the algorithm will use action selection probability, sampling probabilities that, uh, that have some parameter, and that parameter will converge. That's the, that's the assumption we'll make on our RL algorithm. And this, actually, these types, these, this, of course, is feasible for us because we're actually the developers of the algorithm. But this, also, this sort of thing also happens uh, when people are trying to do personalization or RL in more complex environments. Kelly's told me about this, like non-stationary environments, that type of thing. You'll see these types of algorithms which don't completely, they can't converge. Um, you can't end up with non-concentration. They're not trying to appro approximate. See, a regret minimization algorithm is trying to approximate a, uh, uh, like an a indicator variable. And uh, you don't have that happen when you give up on re regret minimization. That'll be the assumption here. OK, so again, uh, large sample theory should hold for differences between means. But we have a problem. We don't know how to characterize uh, uncertainty anymore. That's what we're going to talk about next time. So I want to teach you classical statistics. Okay, This is classical statistics. Like, I don't know, 1940s or something like that. I mean, like old, old classical statistics. Way before Sasha, for sure. <laughs> so in classical statistics, uh, this is kind of the paradigm. Pretty much all methods fit in this paradigm, maximum likelihood, least squares, uh, logistic regression, you name it, it pretty much fits in this paradigm, okay? 1940s or something like that. Uh, you have some parameter, maybe a vector, you want to conduct inference about. You have independent I, in fact, IID data, DI, I equal 1 to N. And you have an, what's called an estimating function. So an estimating function like in likelihood, ma maximum likelihood would be the first derivative with respect to theta. So that would, that's what psi would be, the first derivative of the log likelihood with respect to theta if you were doing maximum likelihood. So the, the parameter you really want to estimate, you want to make inference about theta star, it's, it solves this equation, the expectation of the data under some limiting, under the distribution, the desired distribution. Uh, so theta star solves this equation. And what you do is you do something assimil uh, similar uh, to, this is not empirical risk minimization, but it's close because this is the derivative instead. So it's, you're estimating the zero of this equation. Classical statistics, it's used throughout the decades. Here's an example. Say you're doing least squares. So here I have a least squares equation. The reward is the dependent variable. Here's my regression equation. It's minus the regression equation. I took the first derivative, so you have the derivative for, with respect to theta naught and the derivative with respect to theta 1, and you have it here. So it's just regular, normal equations and least squares. This is an example of this type of problem. And the uh, parameters I'm interested in are these, uh, the, the value of theta 0 and theta 1, which solves this equation. So essentially, they're usually projections in general. Uh, and I'm going to estimate them by just solving the empirical version. Everything's just standard. Um, this type of equation is used very often in clinical trials. Uh, if you, classical biostatistics, they call these generalized estimating equations. It even has a name in that world. OK. So um, our task, of course, we have that, th that classical background. And our task is to derive the term that uh, captures the increased variance in, in our estimator of theta due to the fact 
that we were estimating the sampling policy the whole time during the study. We want to mathematize how our estimator is actually implicitly defined, is it an implicitly defined function of how we sampled the actions during the study. And this happens within the context of doing these estimating functions. And if you're a classical statistician like me, you think this, look, this is not special. I mean, we've been doing this forever. We're always doing this sort of thing, that we have some parameters that we estimate, and then we use those estimators to get an, the estimator of the parameter we care about. We, call, we even call these nuisance parameters and nuisance estimators with this whole way of thinking. So the usual setting here, again, now we're back to the classical statistics. You want to characterize how the parameter that you're, est the estimator you're interested in is actually an implicitly defined function of other parameters you had to estimate. In our case, this is how we sampled our actions. These parameters were in the policies that we used to sample the actions. And this might be the difference between two means, like a treatment effect or something like that. Um, so the way this happens in classical statistics is you, you have this, your estimating function psi, and you plug in these estimators into your estimating function. And then you set it equal to 0. You, average, you take the sum over all the units, the individuals in your data. And then you solve for theta hat. Theta hat is the 0 of this equation. This is the classical way you would do this. And the re okay, I uh, just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Why am I so interested in, in understanding how theta hat is an implicitly defined function of these estimators? Because uncertainty in estimating these guys, that is, uncertainty in estimating the policy, it causes uncertainty in my assessment of a treatment effect or uh, and so on. So it's, it's a, it's, I want to understand how it's an implicitly defined f function in order to propagate uncertainty. Uncertainty from here into uncertainty in here. That's, that's the whole purpose. That's the reason why we need to have this implicit, we need to understand that implicit function. Okay, and in the classical setting you'd have this equation, which is totally wonderful, because what you would do is I've just written the exact same thing again. What you do is you take the derivative of both sides of this equation. You differentiate both sides with respect to all these, these parameters here. They're called nuisance parameter, nuisance estimators. You, you differentiate both sides. You get 0 on this side, no problem. You get the derivative of theta. You write derivative of theta with respect to all these beta hats. And then you have the part that's a function of the beta hats. And then you, you solve for the derivative of theta with respect to all these parameters. And that's how you end up showing how you can propagate uncertainty. So it's, what you really want to understand is you want to understand the derivative of theta hat with respect to all of these in order to understand variation, how variation in the, in the beta hats propagates to theta hat. You want to understand that derivative and that function. That doesn't work for us. Doesn't work in our problem. Why, 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 why doesn't it not work in our problem? In our problem, we don't have an equation like this. Our problem, we have an equation in which we know we have these, the parameters in the policy that's being learned by the RL algorithm. Where they were used, we know they're involved. But they're used to decide what data we should observe. They're not explicit in our estimating function. They're implicit. They're hidden inside this data here. So how am I going to differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to the betas? I mean, I'm dead. I'm dead in the water. Kelly's dead in the water. <laughs> It's a disaster. I'm planning on Sasha to all of a sudden realize what we're going to do next, but I'm going to wait a second. <laughs> uh, so the first thing to realize is der derivatives, they're kind of lo local, right? 
So we want the derivative. We want to take a derivative, but we want it to be local around a certain, the, these estimators. So we need to have, we need to figure out pathways where we can differentiate this equation with respect to these beta hats. So what did we end up, once, once you see what we did, you'll say, well, of course, duh. But it took us quite some time to figure it out. Okay, so we have, to, we have to differentiate both sides of that equation with respect to the betas. And the betas are completely hidden in the A's. So what we do is this is totally, a, a, completely a theoretical tool. It has no uh, relevance for estimation. Is we form, this is a radon nicotine derivative, um, or you could call it an importance weight. Um, so we, we form this weight. The denominator is how the actions were actually selected by the RL algorithm during the study. The numerator is just for some fixed betas. The denominator, uh, okay, so uh, theta hat, well, how do we get theta hat, the, the, our estimator of our treatment effect, for example? Well, we put in place of the, in the numerator, in place of these betas, we put beta hat, and the whole weight goes to one, and you have exactly the estimating function I showed you on the prior slide. So to derive theta hat, all I do is I put the, my estimated policy parameters in here, this weight goes to, is one, and I'm back to the equation I showed you to, before. But to differentiate, to understand how to differentiate now, this is where the weight becomes useful. Because now I'm going to differentiate in these beta t t's locally around what I, on the, the estimator. So now I can differentiate both sides with respect to the, all the, the parameters in the policies that was used by the RL algorithm. Differentiate both sides. So I'll, I'll have a derivative term that has, that's coming from this numerator. And then I'll have a derivative term because I know that theta, because it solves this, theta hat solves this equation, I'll have to have a derivative of theta with respect to the betas. So I get exactly what I need. I get a way to derive theta hat as a function, the derivative of theta hat as a function of the policy parameters. This opens up the door to uh, classical, more classical statistical analysis. There's no actual weighting. This is completely a theoretical tool. There's no weighting, weighting in the data analysis. This is simply to be able to uh, propagate uncertainty by taking the understanding how theta hat, the estimator of the treatment effect, is an implicitly a function of the policy parameters. OK, so there's a theorem associated with this. Just a classical type. It, actually, the theorem still requires some work because you still have dependence between individuals. So you, all of your the central limit theorems have to allow for that. But nonetheless, this is the class. And actually, if you were a, a classical statistician, you would look at this and you'd say, oh, this looks exactly like the kind of result you would expect to see in a longitudinal setting. It looks very similar. One always gets these kinds of a normal distribution, these classical settings. You always, the variance, covari the variance covariance matrix of that uh, approximating normal always has this sort of formula. Uh, they call it a sandwich formula because the outside are the same. And um, then you have an inside part. Uh, nothing has changed. The outside part is just the first derivative with respect to theta. What changes is this inside part. And you get an extra term. This f is linear, OK? I just, uh, if I tried to write it out, it would go off the slide. So I just uh, put f here. Uh, so what you get is you, uh, because you have this implicit, this sampling by the RL algorithm, what you get is you get an extra term in the inside of the variance in the middle of the variance term. And it, the extra term is due to how theta, the, the treatment effect that you want to estimate, is how it is an implicit function of how the data was collected. So for example, if 
the treatment effect you want to estimate is not impacted by how the data is collected. This will be zero and it goes away. So the, the more the uh, treatment effect that you care to estimate is impacted by how the data is collected, the more this, this term plays a bigger and bigger role. Extra term. I'm just repeating myself, reminding myself that this is the adjustment now due to the adaptive sampling by the RL algorithm. Okay, I'm going to show you the results of a, a small simulation. This is truth in advertising. Okay, so uh, we have a, a linear model for our reward. It depends on all the prior uh, the, uh, the prior reward and prior actions. It has correlated uh, within unit correlated error terms, so across time within one individual, the error terms are correlated. Uh, the weights on these actions are exponentially decaying. So it's, allow, it's like a general longitudinal setting. It's one instance of what a longitudinal setting might look like. And the algorithm is going to be, the RL algorithm is very, very simple. It's highly simplistic. It just does a linear regression of the current reward on the current action, the current state. Here, the current state is just the prior reward. It, it, uh, it, it estimates the weights, which are the parameters that will go into the policy. And then it uh, uses uh, a soft max and then clips it above and below. I think it's 0.1 and 0.9, right, Kelly, in this one? 0.1 and 0.9. Yeah, here it is. So it's a very simple kind of uh, exploration. It's called Boltzmann exploration. So now the study's over. You run that simulation. Uh, you, run, you create the data. So now I'm going to go and analyze the data after the study, between studies. So now what I do is I regress my reward, brushing efficiency score in the case of Oralytics, on now I'm going to use uh, the, uh, the action, the current state, and the action times the current state, and again, this very simple state. This is a, this is a marginal model, okay? We've got to be really upfront here. This is a classical marginal model. It's not the same as how the data was generated. And that's very common. In longitudinal analysis, one typically estimates marginal models. We'll use the adaptive sandwich estimator. So here's the first two uh, columns. We want to uh, obtain a 95% confidence region for our estimated uh, theta star. And uh, if we use the usual sandwich estimator that doesn't adjust for the dependence by the RL algorithm, you get really poor poor confidence level, which it's just you don't have as much information as you think you do. That's the real issue here. Uh, yet our, our, our method, we get, we're, we're, try, we're aiming for 95% confidence, and we get 94 here. This is within error, but we get lower rates here for n equal 100. We have to do s small sample corrections for this problem, and we haven't done that. Not the, not the right ones. We've got to work on that. I just want to, I'll put this one here. I want you to understand. So here's a case where the treatment effect depends only very, very little on how the data was collected. So the treatment effect you're trying to estimate depends very little on how the data was collected. And here, everything works fine. It all works great. So what are the next steps? Well, right now, so we have that trial that's going to go in in uh, February, March. We have to provide, there's a, a, a biostat team. We have to provide an R package to them so that they can estimate uh, their variances for any kind of analysis they want to use. Uh, it also has, this R package has to allow for incremental recruitment because that's how people are recruited in clinical trials. They're not aligned. They come in, in this case, we're expecting around four users per week. 
Uh, and we're almost, we're almost finished with the uh, RL algorithm. We're very close. We're, we're finished with it for the pilots. There's going to be a pilot study uh, to assess stability, and we're finished with that, but uh, then it'll get revised again. And then the algorithm will get deployed. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. We have time for a few questions. Any questions for the speaker? Thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, are that, are that, I find like the, the kind of theme of wanting to use a more advanced algorithm but kind of being held back because you want to be able to analyze it afterwards quite cool. But are there, are there other things that you would that other kinds of algorithm that you would actually really want to use but feel that you can't because it was going to have... Yeah. Uh, so um, the algorithm we're actually going to use is going to be some, a variant of a Thompson sampling algorithm. Uh, but I'd, what I'd really... So, and the prior will be an informative prior because, uh, it, because you only have 140 time points per person and you only have 70 people, 75 people, so you need an informant. You have to have a good warm start. Uh, but if I was, I guess, well, what I'd really like to do, actually, we could do, we just, we don't have the, um, what we really need to do in these problems, I don't feel so, uh, Everybody wants to run, you know, some fancy RL algorithm with deep learning. That's not, I think, the game here in this problem. The real game is the true states are, are, um, are probably going to all be predictions and detections. These are really POM DPs. And so, um, and, and you can't do a POM DP in real life, not in an online setting. So um, what, I, what I really want is I want, and I've, I'm always advertising this, I really want to, what we really want is to maintain, a build, and then update online a variety of detections and predictions, along with measures of confidence that'll enter into the algorithm. That's what I really want. And that's feasible. That could happen. We just haven't done that. Yeah. So what I want is possible. And that's how you get complexity in these kind of problems. Um, it's really critical that the policy we learn be interpretable. So any kind of notion that we're going to do some deep learning to get a policy, that's just not going to work. Then, and the way, if you use predictions and detections, you can validate that outside of this study, and they become a prediction of stress, for example, a prediction that someone's going to not charge their, their toothbrush. All of these can be validated, at least they, they can be validated somewhat outside of the study. So they become interpretable features. Hello. Um, thank you for this talk. It's very interesting. Um, I was sort of curious, because this talk was a lot about the estimation aspect of causal inference, but did you encounter any identification issues with dependent treatment effects, right? As you pooled, what about the identification case there? This is the right question. So right now, Kelly and I, she doesn't have my name on her phone when I call her. So uh, unfortunately, she picked up her phone yesterday, Sunday. <laughs> And I called her. And uh, so we're rewriting this whole paper. And the reason why we're rewriting it is we're separating the assumptions that are made on the RL algorithm from the assumptions that have to be made on the estimating function, right? And the estimating function must play nice with the RL algorithm. We'll be able to constrain the RL algorithm in a certain way. We're going to ensure that we have concentration. We're going to do all of that. But we do need certain variants, certain um, matrices to be invertible, and that's gonna, that could potentially impose constraints on the uh, between study learning. But we haven't characterized that. But I called Kelly yesterday, she accidentally picked it up, 
And we spent I don't know how much time talking about that very problem. We have to, that, we want that to be part of this paper, is what, what are there, if any, constraints on the estimating function given a particular design for the RL algorithm? And it's going to have to do, I think, with inversion of certain matrices. Although I, I thought about this all last night, in the middle of the night, I haven't emailed you yet. But uh, actually, I, I'm not sure. You know, it may be that the constraints are quite minimal. Yeah, no, I, I just can't answer the question just yet. But I'm, t you know, that is the question. No, I was just curious because I feel like Sutva might be a important thing to look at how one can do this if, for like the longitudinal version of Sutva, so stable unit treatment assumption. Um, if you pool treatment across units, maybe there might be. I, oh I, no! Uh, in terms of you, Sutva, the the uh, the individuals never meet each other, so all of the dependence between individuals is carefully, I don't want to say curated, but it's carefully managed because it's only through the use of the algorithm to select actions. So it's a very special kind of dependence. Um, Sudva is not a problem or consistency. Some people might call it consistency. Confounding is definitely not a problem. Uh, we know exactly how people were, were randomized. Um, However, you do have to be careful in these after-study analyses, though. Um, uh, if you're not careful, you can induce, you can introduce confounding by accidentally conditioning on colliders, for example. But that's still not a sattva issue. We're safe on the sattva point of view. More questions? Actually, one second. Oh, sorry. Hi, Susan. Um, so I have a simple question. So this new variance, right? Um, it depends on that addition. That there is that additional term, and it would be zero. In which case, I believe this estimator is same as it would be zero if theta star and beta have nothing to do with each yeah, other, right? Yeah, exactly. And so is there like a simple heuristic to compare the intervals you might get by pretending, suppose, that the sample size was half or three? And would that be likely the case that effectively, oftentimes, what you have is half sample size than what you uh, would have? Yeah, like so, a simple, you know? Yeah, that's great. So um, these are called design effects. I don't know if you're familiar with survey sampling. Uh, this comes all out of sociology. They. Um, in survey sampling, um, they often sample people in clusters. Uh, and so uh, there's these simple rules of thumb for how you reduce your sample size. And actually, it works pretty good. And originally, uh, before uh, I got lucky and Kelly came on the scene, I kept searching for a design effect. Because I would like to do design effects. That would make it so much easier. Uh, but we haven't been able to get at that at all. Um, so right now what happens is the RL algorithm, the software engineering team, has to output a variety of statistics related to the performance of the RL algorithm. Those statistics have to go into that R package. And that's combined with whatever estimation method the, the biostatistician wants to run. And then together they produce the confidence region. Um, I would really, really like to have design effects, but I, I just, I, I never was able to get anywhere because that is the class, but this is akin to a design effect. Quick, I will shout. So, like, uh, I was thinking because of the clipping, maybe there is hope, but. With the clipping, the clipping allows us to design um, the RL algorithm. We can choose clipping probabilities. If we, if we pre-specify a primary analysis, we can choose clipping probabilities that guarantee a certain power for that primary analysis. So the clipping helps us with pre-specified analyses. The, the problem is these data sets are so expensive to collect. You can't just tell people, oh, you can only do 
one or two analyses. Otherwise, I'm sorry, you know, the data's, you know, you just can't do that. Yeah. And I, I, I do want to say uh, people have worked in this area. M uh, most of the work in this type of area where you have adaptive sampling and you want to do between study inference, uh, what ha all the work I know of, um, you make the same, you assume that the assumptions made by the RL algorithm are the same assumptions that you're going to make in the after study inference. And that's just untenable in a clinical trial setting. You would never do something like that. So, so you mentioned, um, you know, earlier in your talk that uh, when you only have a uh, 140 of these uh, observations that uh, per human per human that pooling is necessary. Well, so I'm just sort that's of, what we yeah yeah I'm just sort of curious. I mean, if you have you know longer sequences, is pooling not needed? Is there a way to think about the theory in terms of dictating what's the optimal way to pool? Well, because that's you a, have these yeah. distributional characterizations right. in terms of the betas, right? I'm totally with you. Yeah, I'm totally with you. So. So like we, so these types of studies require enormous amount of work up front. So like you build a whole simulation test bed, you know, and then you have to run different variants of the RL algorithm, and that's how we arrived at f full pooling, okay? Because we actually wanted a clustered type of algorithm, and it just doesn't outperform, probably because 140 is just not enough time points per. And in the simulation test bed, the users are quite heterogeneous, still full pooling out performs well. Originally, I thought, so these are all non-stationary problems inherently because we don't have the entire state. So originally, I thought we should use some sort of Gaussian process prior, which essentially does exponential discounting of the data as you move forward in time. And again, in our simulation test beds, not worth it. But that doesn't mean we're not going to continue. I think uh, we do have a study where it was a nine-month study. Um, and in future, I think we're going to have more longer studies. But there, non-stationarity comes up. These are inherently tracking problems. They're not really MDPs. It's just that we're approximating them by an MDP. So what we really need to do is learn how to track a policy. They're really tracking problems. Any more questions? All right, one more. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. And my question is like in the within a uh, within study period, you use RL, but sometimes maybe like for example, we just use random control trial. Then the dependency problem won't exist, right? And we can uh, after that we can use some transitional uh, estimators on the. Uh, independent data, right? So we can get everything. But for sure, we will have some regret loss on the within study part. Oh, yeah. Right. But for sure. Uh, so my question is uh, have you have a way to measure how much we lost? If, like, we, if we use random con control trial compared with the uh, online, online, re uh, online reinforcement learning, we don't lose a lot. In yeah, regret. but in a randomized control trial, we don't personalize at all. Yes. Yes, like. So we so a randomized control trial prioritizes between study learning over within it does a complete prioritization only between study learning. Uh, regret minimization says forget about between study learning. Essentially, I mean this is a little too black and white, but it says uh, and uh, I'm being a little too black and white. Um, but essentially, an RCT prioritizes between study learning. And uh, a regret minimization algorithm prioritizes within study learning. They're, the, they're kind of like the two extremes. This study, this Oralitic study, after we finish this trial, we are funded to go to an RCT. And in that RCT, the treatment arm, there'll be two arms, a control arm, a treatment, the treatment arm will use a pooling RL algorithm, if, if we don't screw up, you know, if, you know. If I don't get kicked off the project, the, the treatment arm will use an RL algorithm. But it'll use the RL algorithm that got refined multiple times through both simulation test beds. The study we're going to do here will build a new simulation test bed. But we'll still try and personalize. 
I think longer term, we should, instead of thinking about RCTs really, I'm framing everything as between study and within study learning, but this is not really where I'm going. Where I'm going is suppose you implement something like this in real life. Then uh, suppose Kaiser implements this, for example, in Southern in California. Uh, then you want to have uh, some sort of monitoring that at regular intervals you analyze the batch data and you maybe new actions have come up, maybe new sensors, so you might want to enhance the algorithm. So you're going to have some higher level supervision that's going to use batch analyses and that's the between study learning here, is that higher level supervision. I mean that's really the game. Uh, it's just that in these NIH-funded studies, it's, it's more RCT and that sort of thing. Okay, so let's thank Susan again for a great talk and a great discussion. Thanks.